I don't know if you know this, but I always try to add a little Bible trivia into my sermons, something that I learned in preparation. And this week I'm starting. I'm starting with the Bible trivia of the day. They tell me that by word count, the book of Jeremiah is the longest in the Bible. And I never would have guessed, because Psalms takes up so much more room, but apparently somebody counted all the words. Wasn't me, and I will take their word for it. So let's say it's the longest. It's a book that's worth the work of reading, though. Jeremiah lived a dramatic life as a prophet, and this is his memoir as well as a recording of all his prophecies. That makes it both very interesting and very moving because you learn about his life. Now, I'm not sure any, any prophet <clears throat> excuse me, was thrilled to receive the call. Now, last week, um, Wayne mentioned that Isaiah said, here am I, send me. So Isaiah may have been, but many of the rest of them were not happy about it. Jeremiah was never, ever comfortable in his role. Through all the excitement that he lived, he remained reluctant. He was insecure. He was often depressed. He was even known as the weeping prophet. The best reason to read this book, though, is because Jeremiah spoke with God. God gave him a message that he didn't want to deliver, and he desperately wished he could keep quiet, but he found that, he says, God's word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones, and he had to express it. And the word heart runs through this book like a string of pearls. No other prophet showed his feelings more openly than Jeremiah. Because of his awful message that he had, he told God that he wished he were dead. He accused God of being unreliable, and God offered really no sympathy. Instead, he promised more of the same. He just said that he would always be with Jeremiah. He would stand by him. Their relationship, doubts and all, are one of the best examples in the Bible of what it means to follow God in spite of everything. Jeremiah was a truly great man. This book reminds us that God's message is not always comforting and encouraging, and that message is that the people who disregard God will have reason to fear. For a world that defies him, God plans judgment. And no one, not even his chosen messengers, will always escape suffering. However, God's presence will make them strong enough to face it. So as we talk about Jeremiah today, I've already given you a hint that the key word here is heart. All through this book. Key verse, I have two. I'm going, doing a little, something a little different this time. Two key verses. The first one is Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? But we learn that when a heart is broken, it's the place where God writes his new covenant. And that's our second key verse, Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So, the dates of Jeremiah's ministry are from 627 B.C. to 586 B.C., and if you can't do the math real fast, that's about 40 years. These two verses, art is deceitful above all things, and this one about the New Covenant, they hold the whole Bible. The whole gospel is right there. So let's start with Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Think about, I said it's the whole Bible, so think about in the beginning. Adam and Eve, they're like two innocent babies who, as soon as they're able, make a bad choice. Kids are like that, right? Kids test the limits. Kids want to be independent. Kids want to know more than their parents, and eventually kids think they do know more than their parents. The knowledge of good and evil. In a sense, Adam and Eve knew the difference between good and evil before they tasted of the fruit. They knew that God was good. They knew what God asked of them, and they decided that, ah, I think the snake knows better. 
That's kind of weird. Just like a good parent, God set limits. And when the limits were crossed, God punished. So when your 10-year-old steals money out of your purse, you figure out the right punishment. Every 10-year-old is going to do stuff like this. 10-year-olds often don't understand just how likely they are to get caught or to understand in the moment of temptation just what that punishment will mean. And with the best of 10-year-olds, you hope that the worst part of the punishment is knowing that they've disappointed you. That's Adam and Eve. They were so unhappy that they had disappointed God that they hid from him in the garden. But then, kids become teenagers. And in the days before cell phones, when your teenager stayed out past curfew and worried you to distraction, it was likely because they would rather disappoint you than disappoint their friends by breaking up the party. And that hurts you as a parent. As a parent, you want your kid to love you as you love them. That's how it got between God and humanity. Things only got worse. In those adolescent-like years before Noah, the people pushed and they pushed and they pushed, and the heart is deceitful above all things. Even before God gave the law to Moses, people knew what God wanted. Noah wasn't righteous by accident. People knew. But the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Other translations say that the heart is desperately wicked, exceedingly corrupt, extremely sick, perverse, evil, incurable, beyond remedy. I mean, that's bad. And God nearly destroyed humanity because he couldn't look at all the evil anymore. Noah and his family were the only ones left. Then, after the earth was repopulated, God set apart the people of Israel as his own special people so that they would be, at least be an example, a light to the world. He brought them out of slavery in Egypt so that they would recognize both his power and his love for them. God gave Moses the law so that the people of Israel would know, be without excuse. The Ten Commandments are evenly divided, neatly divided, I should say, between how we should treat God as completely holy and the only one fully deserving of our worship, and how we should treat other people. Our parents are to be honored, our neighbors and their families and their property is to be respected. Pretty straightforward, almost as straightforward as don't eat from that tree. But the people of Israel broke every single one of those commandments. And the one that God couldn't abide was breaking that first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, in this group here, our congregation, I'm pretty sure that all of us believe in one God and have a hard time understanding the appeal of bowing before a statue. But the same thing that causes us to worship money and power and even beauty is what caused the Israelites to try out other gods. We think that we have a better way of living our lives than God's way. Our hearts are deceitful. Israel did go through a time of success and prosperity after they entered the promised land, and they were ruled by David and by Solomon. But then things deteriorated. They kept going back to idols. The kingdom split in two. The northern kingdom was destroyed by Assyria. And then 100, 150 years later, we come to the time of Jeremiah in the southern kingdom of Judah. Judah was on the brink of disaster because of the continuing disobedience of the people. So who is this Jeremiah? Jeremiah was a member of a priestly family, the household of Hilkiah. And remember, the job of a priest was inherited, so apparently Jer Jeremiah was in line to be a priest. And in our Old Testament reading this morning that Lydia read, it was about how Jeremiah was called to be a prophet before he was conceived, before he was formed in his mother's womb. God reached out his hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth, saying, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. That would be a moment you would never forget. God reached out his hand and touched his lips. No matter how much you might want to forget, if you're Jeremiah. 
I said that Jeremiah's work took place over 40 years. It was during the reign of Judah's final five kings, Josiah, the good king, uh, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. As far as other prophets, Jeremiah's ministry came just after the prophet Zephaniah. Joel and Micah had already prophesied about Judah's judgment, and God's leading prophet at this time besides Jeremiah was Habakkuk. Later, Ezekiel and Daniel come along during the exile. Jeremiah was a man with very few friends. God didn't even allow him to get married. He didn't have children. His closest companion was his scribe, Baruch, who wrote down Jeremiah's words as he dictated them. Baruch was a good guy. He took his own life in his hands when he followed Jeremiah's instructions to go read these prophecies in public after the king and leadership of Judah had chased Jeremiah out of Jerusalem. Baruch even accompanied Jeremiah on the long road as a refugee to Egypt after Jerusalem fell. So he did have one very, very good friend. Jeremiah may have been, as I said, a reluctant spokesperson for God, but he was also fearless and faithful in God's service. God said to him, I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you to rescue and save you, declares the Lord. And that is exactly how Jeremiah lived his life. Jeremiah is the pattern of a prophet, almost a caricature. You've seen those cartoons with the guy with the crazy eyes and the long beard and the sign that says the end is near? That's Jeremiah. He was literally a prophet of doom. And the doom he predicted was the captivity of Judah by Babylon. The people of Judah believed nothing could be worse than this. So, when Jeremiah predicted defeat, most of them despised him as a traitor. Imagine for a moment a Ukrainian prophet saying, we're going to lose to Russia because Ukraine is so evil, and everybody's going to be exiled, and the best course of action would be to surrender right now. The people of Ukraine would think that was nuts. They'd say, hey, we're not as evil as Russia. We will never surrender. And that's the thinking that Jeremiah was up against. And of course, I am not saying that God is punishing Ukraine. I'm making an analogy. I'm just saying Jeremiah was put in a terrible position. Yet, even though everybody despised him, Jeremiah loved the people of Judah, and it broke his heart to know that what he was saying was true. He wanted to see them in a right relationship with their God. More than anything, that's what he wanted. He didn't just struggle with the people and the leaders of Judah. He struggled with God. He complained a lot. He even asked for vengeance on his enemies. Keep in mind, these were also the enemies of God. Here's just one example of Jeremiah's complaining. You are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you, yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You've planted them and they've taken root. They grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Jeremiah has this outsized sense of justice, and even God gets questioned by his high standards. But mostly, Jeremiah rains down a message of God's judgment in chapter after chapter. And what does God say he wants? Well, God wants his people to worship him alone, and he wants them to treat each other with justice, just like those two sections of the Ten Commandments. Here's the crux of it in Jeremiah chapter 7. Oops. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. Don't follow other gods, you see that right there, and deal with each other justly. That's it. Sounds familiar, right? In fact, this is what Jesus teaches. In Mark we read, 
one of the teachers of the law asked Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Says it all the way through the Bible. It's clear that we continue to deal with these same things in every generation. Jeremiah wasn't preaching anything particularly new, but for his efforts, he was paid in rejection and in persecution. There was opposition by the Judean leadership, of course, and opposition from false prophets. Many of them preached words of peace and prosperity in spite of the gathering evidence that Babylon was way too powerful for them. At one point, the religious leaders tried to have Jeremiah executed. He had to run from the king and the political leaders. At another point, the rulers threw Jeremiah into a muddy cistern and left him to die. He was eventually rescued. And Jerusalem, of course, did fall to Babylon, just as Jeremiah had predicted. Many of the people, including all the leadership, were carried off into captivity also, just as he said. He was right about that. I called him the prophet of doom, yet Jeremiah also preached hope. He preached that Judah's slavery would end after 70 years. The whole country will become a desolate wasteland, that's Israel, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians, for the guilt declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. He also preached that they would be fruitful again. Even though bad kings had scattered God's flock, God told Jeremiah that good shepherds would one day take care of the remnant of the sheep. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful an increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Jeremiah preached that they would have a righteous king. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. Now this, of course, is a prediction about the Messiah, Jesus, God's Son. And then Jeremiah also tells us the good news, the very good news, about the new covenant. That is the rest of the gospel here, the really good news. Oops, did I skip it? There we go. Our second key verse. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. This is the new covenant. This is the kingdom of God. The new covenant is fulfilled in the work of Jesus, who offers salvation through his sinless life, through his death and his victorious resurrection. Through faith, we can have a real living relationship with God. He can be our God, our king, and we can be his people. The new covenant is established in Jesus' own blood and is made effective through the work of the Holy Spirit in giving believers the hearts that desire to keep God's holy law. The law is in our minds and written on our hearts, and this law is the law of love. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Jeremiah also looks forward not only to the coming of Jesus Christ, the true heir of David, he also looks forward to us, you and me. Jeremiah says that the God of Israel isn't only for Israel. God's promise to Abraham that in him all the families of the world will be blessed. It will be fulfilled. 
According to Jeremiah, God will not be deterred from his ultimate purpose in calling up to himself a people from every tribe and language, nation, and tongue. The people of Israel will return to the promised land, and then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. In those days when your numbers have increased greatly in the land, declares the Lord, people will no longer say, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, it will never enter their minds, nor be remembered. It will not be missed, nor will another one be made. At that time, they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And all nations will gather in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. No longer will they follow the stubbornness of their evil hearts. So when the city of Jerusalem did fall, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, released Jeremiah from confinement. He was in prison, gave him the freedom to go wherever he chose. Jeremiah decided to stay in Judah, but this too turned out badly. The Babylonians made um, Gedaliah a governor, and somebody decided, we don't like that, so they assassinated him, and then everybody else got kind of scared and ran off to Egypt. So they took Jeremiah with them, even though he didn't want to go. His last known prophetic act was to attempt to persuade these refugees in Egypt to stop worshiping another false god, the Queen of Heaven. And this also failed. We don't know if he ever made it out of Egypt and back to Judah. He may have died there. So the message of Jeremiah is, I hope by now, clear. Love the Lord more than you love the security of being in charge or having money, or enjoying the military strength of your nation. Love other people more than you love your political ideology, or even more than you love yourself. If we're in the kingdom of God, we need to recognize where our ultimate loyalties are. And I want you to consider that. If you think I'm getting a little out of line here, if I am have as... My husband used to say, left preaching and gone to meddling. (laughs) Remember that Jeremiah was accused of being unpatriotic, even a traitor, because he relentlessly criticized the people for preferring nationalism over undivided loyalty to God's rule. It seems clear to me that the message is needed in our own day when people choose their political loyalties over obedience to God. Let us rather seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. Let us follow the law of love. Amen.